Hi, this is Tim Stolinski, co-owner of Band of Bards Publishing. You can check us on at Band of Bards on Twitter, bandofbards.com, and you're watching Two Geeks Talking. Good morning, afternoon, evening, everyone. Two Geeks Talking is an entertainment industry interview show where we interview the creative people from the comic, film, TV, movie, and video game industries. Of course, I'm your host, Kurt Sasso. We are joined today by a returning guest. It feels like they were here a couple of months back, which, in fact, they were <laughs> earlier this year, 2022. Uh, the owners of Band of Bards, we finally have the actual face of the man behind the picture from the previous interview. We're joined today by Tim Stolinski, owner, uh, co-owner, I should say, of Band of Bars Publishing. And how are you doing today? I'm doing great. Thanks for having me, Kurt. <laughs> it's great seeing you finally, you know, for the first time. <laughs> so so uh, welcome back to the show. Thank you. I appreciate it. Yeah. You know, for those that don't know anything about yourself as as a business owner and, mm -hmm. of course, as the owner of uh, co-owner of Band of Arts Publishing, uh, tell us who you are, what you're about, and what you're bringing to Two Geeks Talking. I, I, I'm the other half of band of bards i think i was on last time just bad audio uh video we're here a little bit over a year after our founding we've had quite a lot happen in this past year um some big announcements recently and right now we are kickstarting our first anthology that's a gigantic two book collection called the dark side of purity and we'll be quickly following it up with another anthology in july and in, into august with from the static lots going on you, well, you always remember your first anthology, and I, I think this anthology specifically, even even currently as of right now and, and in the future, is definitely worth talking about for sure, obviously, because you're on the show to talk about it. So tell us what exactly is The Dark Side of Purity, and how did Band of Bards get uh, involved in it? Sure thing. The Dark Side of Purity, and, and the shortest way I can put it, is an anti-patriarchy two-book collection of prose, poetry, comics, graphic poetry, mixed media, and it's all women and non-binary creators, both the writers, poets, and, and illustrators, and basically giving their own takes on the harms of purity culture from all sorts of different backgrounds and perspectives. So then for those that don't know what purity culture is, can mm -hmm. you give us a brief definition of that? Oh, gosh. You know, it's, it's something that really transcends so many different things. It's not specific to any one religion, any one culture, any one country, it, but it's basically a tool of the patriarchy and a tool of a power structure that's used to put women in their place. It's probably the shortest way I can say it. A lot of like very specific tools uh, around it and different things, but a lot of it has to do with controlling women's uh, sexuality. And a lot of it is not sexuality based, right? It, it's about telling a woman how to be chaste and pure and how to be a good wife to a man and how to support a man and what a woman should be doing to be attractive uh, to a man. So then looking at this anthology, when you first got wind of it and when you first started working with, and I apologize, who, who was the mm -hmm. original creator of the anthology? Because we, we should bring that up. Very long story. I'll do my best to condense it. I'm a long-winded person. Elise Russell, who was one of our bards, and she did Sentience, which we just finished up last month uh, on Zoop. We have a lot more works with her planned this year and next. So she's been working on her own to create this, this anthology. And it started off as like a personal project of hers that she had a lot of passion about. As she kind of like just kind of brainstormed it on her own, it became a, a revelation. Like, why just keep it to my voice? Why don't I bring a lot more voices in and make this a big anthology? Uh, and it's grown. It's got over three dozen creators between, again, poets, prose, comics, the illustrators, just an amazing, amazing lineup of talent. She's been working on this for about a year at this point. And we had had a lot of conversations over the last several months about, well, how do we make something like this? Because it's not just comics, so it's a little bit different for us. How do we give this a fair treatment? How do we do the best we can do as a publisher? We explored like co-publishing, explored just trying to kind of push out the timeline and expect it to be doing this in 2023. And then all the stuff with Roe v. Wade has popped off in the last few months in America. With that context, I approached Elise and said, hey, 
this is like a moment in history that is demanding a work like this. It it's, needs to be in the conversation. It needs to open up eyes and show people why reproductive rights are so vitally important. That's accelerating our timeline by like 12 to 18 months. Is that even possible, right? Is it, you know, I don't want to like put a whole bunch of pressure on these folks and say, hey, we're going to do it right now. Get ready. Tough, sh you know, tough, tough luck. If, if you're not, Elise has maintained like a private discord with all the creators that we're not part of, right? Mm -hmm. It's their own way to speak, uh, speak freely without us being able to see it. And, and, you know, not that we're a meddling publisher, but I think it's important to respect the creative space like that. We have our own other Discord channels with Band of Bards that we use to communicate with some of the creators. At least took it back to them and say, hey, this is what the publisher is asking. If, if this is something that the team wants to do, uh, they'll support it. If not, you know, they'll support that decision as well. Uh, it was unanimous that all the creators wanted to move forward on it and do it right now. I threw a couple of different time windows where we had some space on our calendar that we could fit another Kickstarter in. Not ideal, but hey, don't always get to operate in an ideal environment. Mm -hmm. So one of the windows was you know, like June to July and the other would have been like later end of summer. And it was unanimous. Everybody wanted to go full speed ahead, do it right now. Much to their credit, they've been able to accelerate a lot of their own work. They've been great partners in this. This is certainly something that's um, not like the other crowdfunding campaigns we've done where, you know, we essentially have like complete control over it and are shouldering the entire workload. This is something that I said, like, we're going to do it and do it this quickly. We are going to need a little bit more from the creative team in terms of helping to promote mm -hmm. and helping to get attention and traction. Cause it's, you know, 12 K uh, initial goal. Yeah. Has some stretch goals in there and it's two books, right? The prose and poetry collection is 200 pages. That's volume one mm -hmm. and volume two is more or less a graphic narrative and roughly peg, uh, pegging it at 60 pages. It may be a little bit less than that, but for budgeting sake, I was like, let's, let's estimate it at 60 so that we come in a little bit under that and it's a little bit lower cost. Cool. We've planned, we've planned well. Full speed ahead. It's very hectic. We are about $400 from our halfway point today so that we launched Monday. It's now Saturday. So not bad. Um, you always want to have made more progress and be closer to your goal. Like it's awesome to have be funded in one day, <laughs> but uh, you have to have reasonable expectations, especially with a campaign like this. Out of these stories that you've been poems and prose that you've gotten to read are there any mm. that kind of just stick out that are as in your mind uh, as a powerful mm. well i'm sure they all have powerful messages yeah. but is there is there any in particular that have like s stuck with you specifically sure uh first i want to say and give full credit to elise as a yes. curator she's the one hurting everybody <laughs> you know she's the one doing the project management in a lot of respects so full credit to elise amount of work and the size of the tasks that she's taken on and doing an exceptional job with it. It was amazing. In terms of some of the finished work, the illustrations are what I think get me right. And, and personal bias, right? Mm -hmm. I think I've said it before, maybe on the show that to me, comics are the ultimate medium because you get all the benefits of poetry and prose. You can use all those tools in a comic in your narrative and your dialogue and everything else. But you've got an actual illustration to, that really just grabs you by the collar and hits you in, in all the emotional ways possible. Uh, Rio Burton's pages, I think, are probably some of the most amazing things I've seen. You can tell Rio's illustrations as soon as you see them. She just has such a distinct style I don't need to know that it came from her. I just see it and like, that's Rio's work. Her story that she's doing, Wild Heart. We've got the first couple pages from that up on the Kickstarter page. I actually have a third page that we'll have to reveal uh, this coming week. Honestly, I think the single most gorgeous piece of artwork I have seen since we started being a publisher is Sarah Allen Reed's illustration 
from the story Robin Singer wrote, Husband of the Night. Sarah's work is just, I, I don't have words to do justice to it. <laughs> um, it's just simply stunning. With today's climate in terms of, and of course, June being Pride Month as well, too. I mean, mm-hmm. there, there's a lot of discussion over, over sexuality, over women's rights, over everything like that here, too. And I'm glad that this project is at least showcasing such amazing talent across the board. Uh, yeah. with, with Elise heading the way there. What are you going to take away from this once the Kickstarter is finished and once the mm. books get published? The size of planning for an anthology, I mean, it's just exponentially larger than an individual work. And that that's probably obvious, right? You ac- anticipate that, but it's hard to fully appreciate until you actually go through the practice of it. Like one of the things we did to keep ourselves organized was just setting up like a calendar of each day, a different individual work from the anthology to feature. One of those things where the individual creators are taking the lead on it. And then everybody is basically retweeting and supporting and rallying around that individual's piece. The main pinned tweet on the Band of Arts account, it's got you know, the link to the Kickstarter and then below it, every single individual creator with a lot of the individual titles of their pieces. So we're just kind of like picking off of that. Let's go through this and make sure we're giving a platform to each of these pieces at a different day during the course of the the campaign. So little things like that, that you can do that you don't necessarily have uh, as a tool at your disposal with an individual uh, title. The fact that you're almost halfway funded, uh, and I'm sure by the time this airs, you'll be well past that uh, for sure. And the fact that you're promoting on social media, what has been your reaction then to from from the internet regarding this particular mm-hmm. project? Because I think that's that's definitely important, and especially engaging major maybe future anthologies as well too. It's been very supportive. We uh, we kind of talked a little bit about this on the Band of Bards live stream last night. Part of going into that. You understand that tackling this topic, it is something that can put a target on the backs of creators, especially when we talk about some very deeply personal things. Like there have been some team members who have, you know, I, I'm, I'm amazed at the courage, but they've spoken very publicly about some of their own experiences with the harms of purity culture, with, you know, cases of sexual assault and sexual abuse and just all sorts of other forms of harm. You know, there's a lot of terrible people out there on the internet who will see that and just start attacking more. And that's purity culture in action. So we've talked about how to anticipate that and kind of game plan for what to do. Obviously, everybody knows there's a specific group out there in comics that really likes to dogpile on women in particular and push back about any kind of diversity in comics. We had to have that very frank discussion about like, you know, how to handle this in case it does happen. Very happy it hasn't. That's something that I think needs to be handled very thoughtfully and with a lot of feedback from the entire group because, you know, me, I don't mind having a target on my back. I, I have before <laughs> in very literal or sen- literal senses. I have no problem with that, but that's me. And again, that's a very uh, adroit example of the differences than, and I guess the, uh, the privileges of being a straight cis guy in America versus being anybody else. I, I don't mind, I am not, so concerned about personal attacks, whereas a lot of others need to ha- worry very much about their own physical safety, even because we've only seen how people just go absolutely over the edge about comics yeah. online and will make physical threats and death threats uh, to people because they're just trying to make something that means something to them. And it's like, oh, you need therapy, dude. <laughs> just to say the least. Um... Yeah. Probably need to be locked up somewhere, but yeah, I digress. Well, but I think that's that's unfortunately today's culture in general when it comes to comics, comics and media in general for mm-hmm. that matter. Not even just comics. I mean, you see it with TV shows, you see it with Star Wars, you see it with yeah. 
you know, especially everything that's currently occurring. And and it's not like it hasn't been there. It's been there, but it was quieter back then. Now right. it's being brought to the forefront because you have the internet and you have mm -hmm. the anonymity of being behind a computer screen and a username. And isn't, then, isn't that a powerful feeling? Can Nobody be, know to some yeah. people, yeah, I can. Yeah. Nobody knows who I am and I can just sit here and do all the horrible things I want because I think that no one's going to know it's really me. Yeah. Yeah. You know, so my undergrad degree is in history. So I kind of always have that bit of a mindset when I sit back and think about something. I'm always thinking about, you know, when you watch the news and current events, like, are we at like a very unique point in time or has everything always been this chaotic and crazy? You just didn't have as much information instantly at your fingertips to, to know. Yeah. Uh, you know, you didn't have the situational awareness that we're able to have today. I think it's a little bit of that. And I think it's a little bit of the access that the internet gives to people and the ability to go be complete assholes, you know, without fear of being punched in the mouth. Yeah. Uh, you know, I mean, not to talk about the Oscars, but. I think a lot of folks forget what just how effective a tool the thought that I might get punched if I go across this line, pop off with my mouth in the wrong way. It, it's like in hockey when you want to have the players please each other and you had enforcers. And you can talk about toxic masculinity and how that all gets involved and it absolutely does. Yeah. But there is an absolute truth to the effectiveness of the fact that I should probably not be such an asshole and not pop off with this thing that's in my brain because I might get punched in the mouth. Yeah. There's a place for that. <laughs> the hockey analogy is a good one. I, I have to admit that, that as well. Well done. Uh, um, okay. <laughs> I can't even add to that. That's just, that's perfect. You but, trip but, too much and you might have some more false teeth. <laughs> <laughs> hey, being a dentist back in the day was a great way to make some extra cash. That's for sure. Oh, yeah. So, so my background is, is computer science, but I had a background in, in film and, and art history and all that other stuff too. So I can understand, especially in, in terms of art, the influences of, of the Roman church way back mm. when, and we're talking 14th, 15th century and, and, and beyond, eventually gave way to different art styles and, and different thought processes and the, the ability to question what exactly was real and, and what was not or what mm. you were being told was real. Was that actually true or not? And and I think that's something that is missing in in today's media as well too, because yeah. we take everything on the internet at face value, and we uh, I, I'm saying we as a as a general whole yeah. of the internet itself, not us speaking specifically. If we don't question where this information is coming from, if we don't question what's happening in our society, especially in in comics and in media today, then we might as well just keep walking till it towards our graves i mean yeah. why why wouldn't we want to question what's happening in our world you know th this project is this kickstarter i should say is going on until when uh july 8th and it'll wrap at 8 30 p.m eastern so during the band of bars live stream awesome. um we're going into that with a little bit of an optimistic uh attitude that it'll have met its goal well before then and we'll just be having like a, a little bit of a and a campaign party and doing a live countdown on, on the live stream. Every Friday between now and then lined up with, with folks primarily from the anthology. Damien Beckton is going to be out on the 24th. So what is it like talking with these these people and listening to their stories and everything like that? Um, what what have what have you learned as as a person? Uh, gosh, I think the sad thing is. I'm not learning very much in that I've known how deep the rot goes in purity culture and in society at large. You know, this is something, and, and a lot of guys don't recognize that the patriarchy harms us as well. Um, I like to think of it as, you know, if you think about the traditional white Anglo-Saxon Protestant having control over most of society and the power structures in American society and probably Canadian. But that's what I think of when I think of the patriarchy. You know, if you go back in American history, the only folks who could vote weren't just white guys. It was white land owning men. Right. And there's always been these different 
ways to keep others out. And guys need to wake up and realize that we're part of that other and that we need to stand in solidarity with all of the women and non-binary folks who don't fit into the club, right? And George Carlin always say like, you know, it's a big club and we're not part of it. Guys, that includes us. <laughs> so you should absolutely be standing up and railing against patriarchy as well, because it is harming you. And whether you realize it or not, or whether you feel it or not, if you have any women in your life that you care about, you know, moms, wives, sisters, daughters, cousins, I promise you, there are women in your family who have had to survive and endure all sorts of unspeakable things. If you just shut the hell up and listen, you'll, you'll realize that. So maybe shut the hell up and listen. Roe v. Wade is what spurred us to action, you know, now rather than next year. Mm -hmm. um, and taking our time uh, with a nice, comfortable, uh, less stressful publication, you know, sometimes history forces you into action. And this is certainly a turning point in history um, with the way courts have been stacked and the way politicians are running around doing all sorts of unconstitutional things because a very small minority in America wants to enforce their beliefs, which are, honestly, it, a lot of it stems from their own religious beliefs and, and enforcing those onto the rest of us. Now, it's, it's no time to sit back and to try to say, I stay out of politics. Like Sometimes neutrality makes you part of the problem and you absolutely need to stand up and plant your flag in the ground to where it is, you know, what side you're taking. We stand in solidarity for reproductive rights. Uh, we are donating all profits from this to NARAL. They are a pro-choice advocacy group, a national level one in America. That's another discussion we had with all the team is like, hey, this is something that we should absolutely be donating to charity. Let's make this a benefit project. So with Kickstarter, the terms of service do not allow you to raise funds on their platform that are donated. Oriana Leckert was really awesome in helping me along with that and to be able to craft the message on the Kickstarter page to be very um, clear that Kickstarter is for raising funds to produce the work. So like the printing and manufacturing costs and the creative costs to pay the creators. But the creators do with their money, not a buying business. Band of Bards recently became a, a, a diamond vendor. So we will have distribution through Diamond. Now uh, we also have distribution through Ingram. So we will be able to have two very strong channels of mass distribution of this work following the Kickstarter. And all of the sales that we'll be making, um, that's going to be donated to fight to defend reproductive rights. That, that's great to see. And, and I'm glad that you're able to find a way to, to help support the creators and of course, the national organization as well too, when, once they get started. Yeah, I mean, an important conversation there around, you know, donating to the national versus a lot of locals. Um, I think just because of how spread out we are as a group and, and some are international, you know, we've got creators over in Europe, Scotland, Ireland, gosh. So the problem with our three dozen, I <laughs> struggle to remember. We have some Canadians. Um, More than likely, yeah. Yeah, we do. Uh, Ai Jiang and uh, Fel Hound are, are certainly both in Ontario. Um, yeah. Damon Barrett Roche is over in Switzerland. You know, so yeah, we, we're, we're all over the, the world, really, with this team. I think the comfortable thing for everybody was to pick a, a well, you know, very reputable national level organization to benefit from our work. We haven't really pushed a whole lot on that as of now, because I wanted to make sure we contacted NARAL and spoke with them to make sure that they were cool with this. Obviously, there's no problem about donating, but in terms of how much you promote and highlight the fact and try to tie them into the promotion of our product, it's probably appropriate to first talk to them and be like, hey, we're doing this shared with them a lot of the same files I shared with you. Like, please take a look over this. And I want to make sure that anything we do and, and, you know, associate your organization to this work, you're okay with that. And if I can use some of your logos, that'd be awesome too. They're reviewing it right now. I got an email from, from the lady 
at Nayroll that I've been speaking with um, yesterday, kind of late in the day. They had a bunch of folks out sick this past week, so it's delayed it a, a little bit of their review, but hopefully we'll have a good firm answer for them and they'll, they'll be all on board to, you know, kind of go full speed, you know, with associating what we're doing with dark side of purity and, and, and the benefits to Nayroll. Sometimes contact those types of organizations because I'm sure mm -hmm. they get thousands of, re of requests and, mm -hmm. and everything like that. And trying to, to link something that's worthwhile to their name, obviously yeah. it's a good promotional, not only for yourself, but also for them as well too. And, um, and I think the message you, you that, uh, Alicia and, and everyone has in this book is, um, is well put together. So I think it's a, a worthwhile cause. So to your point about planning for anthologies and stuff, I, I think that's one of those things where like, had we had the benefit of more ideal planning and, and timeline, this would be something that would have been worked out well in advance of a crowdfunding campaign, not operating in an ideal environment. Sometimes you just have to do the best you can with what you've got. Certain things certainly coming out a little bit later than we would have wanted in, in the campaign press releases, contacting media and all that. You don't always get the nice cushions that you would like to have. What's what's the static about? From the static is a horror anthology that we had thought was going to be our first anthology. <laughs> it's certainly the first one that we are putting together in the traditional sense as a publisher. Chris and I are the ones curating it, corralling everybody and doing all the mind-boggling work that Elise is doing right now. He says, a horror anthology we had solicited for it back maybe around October, closer to the end of the last year, had over two or around 200 submissions, which was something to go through. Ooh. We've crafted an anthology with 16 individual stories. The comics, they range from six pages to 10. Just a, a, an insane slew of talent in here with, with um, CJ Hudson, Brent Fisher, Rio Burton, Doug Wood, Wells Thompson, Jared Lujan, and Marcus Jimenez are making one together. Uh, Melissa White, this is really cool. I was really flattered that Melissa, um, you know, an editor at Scout, would submit a pitch for an anthology. Nice. Like, that was super cool. Jimmy Gasparro, member of everybody's favorite comic book Yeti. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and uh, Rob Pilkington with J.J. Lopez. Uh, Matt and Sarah Harding, which is cool, a husband and wife duo. Um, and then you've got other folks who, you know, so it's nice to have like a good group of folks with some name recognition and like, you know, that's flattering to us for one thing, but it certainly will help the book. But then you've got other folks that maybe are, are not so well known, um, but are incredible talents themselves. Uh, E.C. Ibis, Mike Gibson has done some work on his own, um, nice Rochester uh, creator. Uh, Alina Wahab had a really cool story in Nectar, Transfem Anthology. I looked through that because I ha had that sitting over here. So was, as we're looking at her pitch, I'm looking at the work she had in that. And I was like, yeah, yeah. Um, Alina is definitely someone we should have. <laughs> lots of different artistic styles, lots of different styles of horror, right? Some of it's like absolute slasher gore. Uh, some of it is a lot more psychological horror. Some of it's fast paced. Some of it's a slower pace burning kind of slow smoldering anxiety induced horror mm -hmm. so i'm super thrilled with this i don't know if we could have hoped to have had a better group of folks that submitted and one of the interesting things was that we had so many fantastic pitches come in that we had this big like scoring matrix full mm -hmm. of like objective and subjective measures to help us make these cuts because it was hard you know there were friends of ours that we had to get bad news to that sucks mm -hmm. but there were another two dozen pitches that we picked apart and said this is good and it certainly could be in the anthology but it feels like there's more story than could be told in 10 pages to this like it feels it's way too condensed and we started reaching out to those folks about just running their pitch but as like an expanded story roughly 32 to 48 pages the goal there was that let's take these and this was prior to us having diamond distribution mm -hmm. but we had ingram we can make a whole bunch of one shots or, you know, ongoings that would be self-contained full stories in a book. It's something that we can do perfect bound and distribute through Ingram while we wait to work on, on diamond distribution. We have both of those options to our, our, at our disposal now, but that was a, 
the big goal there is it let's work with what we do have on hand it's just a, a happy accident as bob ross would say that we were able to take that submission process and not just make one an awesome anthology out of it like somewhere in the end of july and throughout august we'll be uh we'll have that on kickstarter and then we've got all these other individual self-contained stories that we're able to fill up our 2023 and start to build our 2024 publication calendars unintended but when we saw that, it was like, why just send re rejection letters to these people? Why not see if there's any space there to possibly work with some that would want to, that would be interested in doing this? Uh, almost everybody was on board. You know, there were a couple of folks that didn't work out with. There was one person who sent us back uh, an email that they had no idea we were considering that and we didn't, we should have contacted them because we don't know what their budget was like. I don't know if maybe I didn't communicate very clearly. <laughs> like it, it's been an incredibly successful effort so far. And we're not even reached the Kickstarter. So I'm excited for that. Uh, excited to be able to work with so many people. And that was another thing with, with doing the anthology was that end of the process of signing all the contracts with uh, everybody involved. We doubled the amount of bards with one title. That's something that's really nice. Uh, it's something cool to be able to work with so many different folks. You know, a lot of this industry is trading on reputation. Uh, anybody who doesn't recognize that's probably just not thinking about it or kidding themselves. Like people want to say that they worked with X publisher. People, you know, publishers want to say that they worked with, you know, so-and-so creator. So let's not kid ourselves. Publishers being able to say that they have works with somebody, if they want that too. It's, it's funny that whole relationship there with people hoping that their pitch got through to somebody and that they'll hear back timely and with good news. That's not like just like on one side of the table. That's us when we submit the diamond. That's sometimes us when we submit an idea to a different creator. It's, it's just a funny dynamic to the industry. But it's also interesting, the fact that everyone's looking to get published. And if they're not mm -hmm. self-publishing, then they have a great alternative with Band of Bards. And if you guys can work on something, you know, you're going to make some magic together. And, and that's that's what helps. And the fact, and congratulations, by the way, on the diamond distribution and everything like that as well, too. Like, that's that's a great milestone for a young publishing company, yeah. too. Yeah, thank you very much. It, it certainly is. Like, it doesn't guarantee that you're going to go gangbusters and sell tens of thousands of copies of everything you do, but you aren't going to be able to do that without that distribution. It's a great benchmark. It's a great thing for us to feel good about and, and be proud of that we were able to secure. It's a prestige thing in, in this industry. That's a constant question that'll come up rightfully. So what's your distribution model? Who can, you know, can you get me into stores? You have to be at least one year old before Diamond will consider you, but they are at least now taking digital submissions and not just physical submissions. Yeah, that finally changed after like a year and a half of pandemic. They finally like changed their process on that. I will say they, Josh, our brand rep, and then the folks from the marketing department have been very responsive. Um, I know Diamond does get a bad rap for being hard to get in contact with or to get answers from. Um, and certainly that's probably different for retailers versus vendors, but they have been very good to work with. Well, we are wrapping up here. And while I would normally go into my introspective questions, I don't think that's the right time in terms <laughs> of this conversation here today. But that doesn't mean I won't ask you in the future, because mm -hmm. now that I've seen your face, we can finally <laughs> like have a nice face-to-face -face conversation regarding that. Before I let you go, as we're wrapping up, tell us how can we support, of course, this Kickstarter campaign and, of course... Sure anything else you'd like to promote in regards to this? Sure. Um, well, we'll say in store, I, I sent their first um, product info sheet and everything to Diamond. Uh, prospects will be listed in previews in August and in stores in October. So as soon as we have pre-order codes and stuff for that, we'll certainly be sharing it. Um, so you can come October, you can ask your local comic shop to put Band of Bards titles in your pool list. Uh, we are fully unrolling our street team initiative. Um, you can check that out on our website, bandofbards.com uh, slash street hyphen team. Kickstarter, the dark side of purity is on Kickstarter. Google Kickstarter, dark side of purity. Go to the Kickstarter website and search dark side of purity. 
rather than reading off that big long URL. <laughs> because we cross genres and formats, I've got it set up so that its primary category right now is under publishing and anthologies. Starting next week, I'm going to move it over to comics anthologies. Mm -hmm. So we're going to keep dabbling back and forth so it will pop up in both those listings. Okay. But it, uh, it is a project we love and a Kickstarter staff pick. So it should be popping up kind of close to the top of your pages as you go through and search it. And really the best thing to keep up on all the Band of Barnes news is to subscribe to our newsletter. It comes out once a month, never any spam, only the big Bard announcements. Well, Tim, I do hate to say, but that ends this particular episode of Two Geeks Talking. I want to thank you so much for coming on the show. Thank you so much for having me, Kurt. You can find this interview and, of course, the past interview from Bands of Bards on our website, tgtmedia.com or twogeekstalking.com. But it's probably more likely on our YouTube channel, which is youtube.com forward slash tgtmedia. And of course, because I recently lost my job, I have a Patreon open. So I finally had to push that through, which is patreon.com forward slash TGT Media. And as I say every week, everyone has a story to tell. It's up to me to help bring that out. Thanks for listening, watching on Two Geeks Talking. <laughs>